Good afternoon, members of the media, wider listening and viewing public of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to this week's post-cabinet media conference. Um, we have a very compressed time today due to the commitments of the Honorable Minister of Finance, who is here with me today, and I'll pass it straight over to him. Thank you. Thank you. I thought it would be appropriate to address the media on two topical matters, namely, firstly, the downgrades by the rating agencies, and secondly, to see if I could clarify some issues with respect to the implementation of the property tax. Let me deal with the ratings first. Trinidad and Tobago was placed on a negative outlook by Moody's in 2014-2015. And whenever one of the rating agencies places you on a negative outlook, they do an annual evaluation. So we've been on a negative outlook since then. We maintained our negative outlook in 2016 with a downgrade to the lowest level in the investment grade. And Moody's came, as they are required to do, to look at our situation in 2017. Standard & Poor's has the same approach, that whenever a sovereign nation is on a negative outlook, they do an annual review of the credit rating. When countries have a stable or a positive outlook, the ratings are not done so frequently. But because we have been on a negative outlook for some time, the two rating agencies did their annual evaluations this year. And they're normally done in the first half of the year, usually in the month of April. So both Standard & Poor's and Moody's came to Trinidad and Tobago. Standard & Poor's adjusted our outlook from negative to stable and lowered our rating from A minus to triple B plus. Triple B plus is an investment grade rating and is still fairly high up in the table of investment grade ratings. The reason why Standard & Poor's rated Trinidad and Tobago as stable is that they are of the view that the Trinidad and Tobago economy will recover based on a number of reasons, based significantly on the fiscal consolidation work being done by the new PM administration since we came in. And in this context, fiscal consolidation means trying to bring the accounts into balance, trying to balance expenditure and income. So that the country has suffered a severe loss of income since 2014. In fact, we've lost about $20 billion in income. I don't think many people understand the significance of a $20 billion loss in income. The country's income up to a couple of years ago was $57 billion per year. It's now 37. So that we have to make up that gap, that $20 billion loss in income this is an annual $20 billion in a number of different ways. One of the ways would be to reduce expenditure by reducing subsidies and transfers and just generally controlling expenditure. Another way would be to borrow, uh, uh, including withdrawals from the stabilization fund. And another way would be one-off sale of assets, IPOs, uh, and so on, recovery of money from colonial life and that sort of thing. So that we have this huge gap to make up of $20 billion. It's, it's, it's a f fantastic drop in income. I, if, if it was a company, a company, its income went down by 40%. You could imagine what effect that would have on a company. So all of these rating agencies are looking at the huge reduction in income in Trinidad and Tobago and looking at what the government is doing. So Standard & Poor's looked at what we were doing 
looked at our fiscal consolidation work to reduce expenditure and increase revenue, and looked at what we're doing, especially in the energy sector, in terms of seeking to get new supplies of natural gas, which is the main driver of our economy, through arrangements in Venezuela and also arrangements with the major oil and gas companies like Shell, BP, and so on. And they were satisfied that the work the government is doing and the prospects for economic recovery were such that they could upgrade our outlook from negative to stable. But they lowered our rating from A minus to triple B plus simply because of the significant fall in revenue, the loss of $20 billion. Moody's, which is a more conservative um, rating agency, had already downgraded Trinidad and Tobago to the lowest level in the investment grade table. Moody's looked at the same things that Standard & Poor's looked at. Moody's had a slightly different view to Standard & Poor's. They felt that if the government of Trinidad and Tobago did not slash expenditure further from what we've already done, we've cut expenditure by $10 billion per year, but Moody's was of the view that we should slash expenditure even more. And they felt that because we had not done that, that they would want to give us a BA1 rating, which is at the top of the next level. So we are at the bottom of the investment grade with Moody's that now put us at the top of the next level in the table. Moody's also converted our outlook from negative to stable. Now, there are three big rating agencies in, the, in this part of the world. Standard & Poor's, which controls about 50% of ratings. Moody's, which controls about 35% of ratings. And Fitch, which controls about 15% of ratings. They are called the big three. And for some time now, I have been advised to take a look at whether we should now pursue a rating by all three of the large rating agencies. That is to say that we would now ask Fitch to rate Trinidad and Tobago. Because with respect to the Moody's downgrade, there is a view out there, if you read some of the commentary, that the Moody's downgrade is a bit unreasonable. When you look at the Standard and Poor's rating, which has us well up into the investment grade. So I have been advised, and I think this is good advice, that we should also pursue ratings from Fitch. So we'd have three, the three largest and most reputable credit rating agencies in the world rating Trinidad and Tobago so that investors could get a more balanced perspective on our ratings. And I'll answer any questions that you may wish to ask me on the ratings in a short while. I'd like to move on now to property tax. With respect to property tax, the Ministry of Finance will be rolling out a communications plan starting from tomorrow where officials of the ministry will be making themselves available to the media to answer any questions and to deal with any issues and clarify any matters that um, are required to be clarified. As minister, I just want to clarify uh, one significant issue. There are two pieces of legislation that govern uh, properties and taxation of properties in Trinidad and Tobago. One is called the Valuation of Land Act, which has been in existence for a very long time. And the second one is the Property Tax Act, which is a law that came into place in 2009, 2010, to replace the Land and Building Taxes Act. The current initiative, which is requesting property owners to return a form, in other words, file a return of their property, giving details of the address, the purpose it is being used for, the number of rooms, and an estimate of the value flows from the Valuation of Land Act. It is not an initiative that comes from the Property Tax Act. It's a precursor to the actual valuation itself. So in the Valuation of Land Act, Property owners are required by law to file a return 
And when this adjustment was made, it was made in 2009, and the first return was required in 2010. And then the law said that this would be uh, reviewed every five years. So another return was due more or less in 2015. So the Valuation of Land Act asked property owners, file a return and let us know, you know who you are, where the property is, what type of property it is, how, what's its size in terms of the number of rooms, and what is your estimate of its rental value. That document is then to be used by the Valuations Division of the Ministry of Finance to put a final assessment value on the rental. Because when the Valuation Division processes these forms, it will look at them. In, in many cases, there will already be an assessment number. The property will already be on the system. In some cases, properties will not be on the system. So the purpose of the forms is to assist the Valuation Department to put a value on, the, on properties which is then going to be inserted on a notice, which is then sent to property owners, telling them what the assessed rental value of the properties is, and informing them of the requirement then to pay the property tax, which would be, in this case, the first instance, 3% of the assessed rental value. So that the initiative that is in progress right now is a precursor to the actual assessment notice that property owners will receive telling them what is the assessed rental value of their property and what is the tax that they have to pay. If you go and read the Act, it says that property owners are required, this is the valuation of land act, eh? that, that these returns were required since April 2010, but that Act was never enforced. The question of documents, that is obviously something that needs to be properly clarified. Those documents are simply required to assist the valuation division to identify the property. They are not mandatory. And what has been happening and what I have asked the public servants to do when they face the media over the next couple of weeks is to explain the purpose of the request for these documents and make the point that if you have a utility bill, which is, gives you an address, because the purpose of this initiative, as I said, it's a precursor. It's designed to identify the property and where it is. So that if you have a utility bill, electricity bill, uh, telephone bill, or, or whatever, that identifies the address. And if you have an old receipt, a land and building taxes receipt, that will give the assessment number. The additional documents are designed to deal with properties that are not on the system, properties that have never been assessed. Because in order to get the original assessment number, there would have been a process that would have required the submission of all of these documents in the first place. I can speak from experience. When I um, had my own house completed in 1987, in order to get the assessment number, I had to submit certain documents to the valuation division then, which is 30 years ago. So I am on the system. I have an assessment number. But there will be many properties that are not on the system. And these are required to identify the property. But for existing um, people who are already on the system, really all that's required is the um, copy of the old receipt and a utility bill just to confirm the address. However, if the valuation division is of the view that the information is inadequate, then they may decide to make a visit to the property to take a look at it. If you look at Section 15 of the Valuation of Land Act, you would see that if the commissioner of valuations thinks it is necessary to visit a property to inspect it, the first thing the commissioner of valuations has to do is to seek the consent of the owner. This is an old law. This law has been there for a very, very long time. And the second thing they do if the owner does not consent is that they give the owner notice, 48 hours notice that they're coming to visit the property. But I suggest you familiarize yourself with that section, section 15 of the Valuation of Land Act, because that, has, that was there when the Land and Building Taxes Act was in place, that um, if the Commission of Valuations thought it was necessary to visit a property to inspect it, they would first seek the consent of the owner, and if not, they would then give the owner 48 hours notice they're coming to look at the property. Last week, there was a very irresponsible statement 
made by a member of parliament where he made an allegation that has turned out to be completely false and we deem it to be reckless and an attempt to instill unnecessary fear amongst the public. It was stated that there were criminal acts committed and reports were made to police station at St. Joseph, which have turned out to be completely false, inaccurate, and obviously misleading by that member of parliament. So we want to assure the public that no such acts have taken place. And the allegation was that persons posing as members of the valuation team from the Ministry of Finance had gone into houses and committed very, very um, criminal activities on, on persons and in houses, etc. That is completely false and misleading. And as the Minister of Finance has said, the public servants at the Ministry of Finance will be rolling out the communication plan in the next few days going on for the next couple of weeks. And as part of that, they will identify to us, the members of the public, what are the types of identification that you must look out for if you go through the process that the minister has so carefully told us about, which would include a 48-hour notice, etc. So there's no need for fear by the members of public that this could be used for criminal activity, etc. I also want to make the point that this provision in the Valuation of Land Act has been in existence, as far as I know, since 1970, before the Republican Constitution was brought into effect. And it's, it's, a, it's a little used section of the Act. I personally am not familiar with any instance where this Section 15 of the um, Valuation of Land Act has ever been used by the Commission of Valuations. But that is the legal um, provision, the legal mechanism that is contained in this Valuation of Land Act that allows the Commission of Valuations or a designated representative to ask an owner, can we inspect your property if it's occupied or give 48 hours notice to the property owner that they're coming to look at the property. The, the, the impression that the opposition is giving is that this is happening now. It is not. All that is happening now is asking landowners, property owners, to comply with the Valuation of Land Act, which is submit a return. Let us know where your property is and who the owner is and how many rooms it has and so on. This is, we are far away from a situation where uh, the Commission of Valuations will want to s start entering properties and inspecting properties and so on. After this, the, a lot of assessments will be done. After this May 22nd period, a number of assessments will be done based on the data already in the system. It is obviously going to take a little longer might take quite a lot longer for new properties because there'll be no record of these properties in the system. So that the valuation division will start first, obviously it's only logical, with the properties that are already on the rolls, already in the system, already have an assessment number. And then you start to, what they call, populate the rolls with all of the other properties. It's estimated that out of the 400,000 residential properties in Trinidad and Tobago, households, let's call it households, out of the 400,000 households, less than 200,000 are on the assessment rolls, the valuation rolls. So there are at least 200,000 households, homes, dwellings, outside there that are not in the system. That obviously is a longer exercise to populate the roles with those properties so that it is only logical that we begin with the ones that are on the system. I might also note that notices have not yet been sent to owners of commercial properties, industrial and agricultural, because again, we have to do this thing in stages. So the valuation division is beginning with um, uh, residential properties asking owners to send in your return and let us know who is the owner of this property and so on. Then assessments will be done. Then a notice is sent to the owner, giving him a particular per period of time to pay the tax. And then, of course, there's a appeals process, a, a process to object and go through a system if you don't agree with the valuation that has the assessment notice has been sent to you. So we're at stage one, which, as I said, is just a precursor to the valuations of existing properties 
which will then be converted into notices, which will be sent to property owners, and then they have a period of time to pay the tax or object, as the case may be. There are many records in Trinidad and Tobago. Eh? You have the Election and Boundaries Commission voters list, which has a record of virtually every house in Trinidad and Tobago. You have aerial photographs. You have TSTT records. You have TN Tech records. You have WASA records. So it's not to say that they are not databases. They are copious, comprehensive databases of every single property in Trinidad and Tobago that is connected to electricity, connected to water, to a landline by telephone, and then there are aerial photographs. So that when the first batch of returns come in, these will be matched against the records of the utility companies and the aerial photographs to see which properties owners have not sent in the returns. And then the process will begin to determine the status of that property and take it through the system and so on. The state cannot get involved in what is essentially a private contract between a private individual and a private landowner. But one of the consequences of this process that you might not have thought of is that the landlord now has to declare what the rent is so that if the landlord declares a rent that is not consistent with the actual rent you're paying, there'll be a problem. So you may actually find some rents might go down. Because the person, no, but you see, as we compile the database, because the, 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 the package of legislation allows renters to get into the system to certify what they're actually paying and what they're not paying. You see, there will be many landlords who are collecting rent and not declaring it. They, you know, they, they don't pay tax. They, you know, they, they operate outside of the, of the formal system. Now that it has to be formalized, you may find that some landlords may be a little careful about the rent that they charge because they're going to have to pay property tax based on the rental. And the other thing, uh, one of the benefits that was made known to me yesterday, I hadn't thought of this before, was that by paying property tax, you can cement your ownership of the property. Because some people are afraid that somebody else may come and claim their property and so on. But by paying the tax, I mean, in my own constituency, a lot of people come to me and tell me they've been paying tax on a piece of land for a long time, and they now want to convert this arrangement into ownership so that it's a sense of security. If you're in a formal system where you're paying um, property tax, it cements your ownership of the property. It's an interesting perspective that was given to me yesterday by a friend. Thing. I know people don't like property tax. I am all vexed with myself. <laughs> <laughs> because I had to pay, so I vexed with myself. You know, you, you hear calypsos like that? I and all vexed with himself, vexed with himself, that himself has to fill out the form and pay the tax. I don't, I don't like it. But we in a, this country is in a very difficult position, and we need everybody to contribute to the, 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 the revenues of the country. And, um, and unfortunately, this is one of the measures that um, we must... Um, continue with. We're going to try and make it as simple as possible, as easy as possible for people and you know, as humane as possible. There are provisions in the Act that allow for people who are in an impoverished condition to apply for a, a deferral. And in fact, I'm looking at that to see whether we should convert that deferral into a complete waiver. Because the way the Act is written, it, it gives you the impression that it's deferred for the lifetime of, like, let's take elderly people living in a house in Woodbrook, for example, where, where they, they're on fixed incomes, they're on pension, they can't pay the tax and so on. That person would in all likelihood qualify for a deferral, but the impression is given that if they then gift that property to their children, the person inherits it, they are then liable for all of the tax that was never paid. So as we go along, these are things that we'll be looking at to see whether in fact, you should burden somebody with that liability coming forward. But it's a complex, it's a complex issue. These are not simple problems, and there are no simple solutions to them. The other thing that we're going to look at, because for the first time, we're going to be valuing plant and equipment, machinery, uh, collecting tax on it. Let's put it that way. For the first time, we'll be collecting tax on plant and equipment and machinery. We have to look at it. We have to look at the percentages. 
look at the 3%, the 5%, the 8%, and so on. As we go along and we see how much revenue we're collecting, whether these percentages are appropriate, whether they should be reduced, I, I, I don't see any reason why they should be increased. But I mean, it's things that we need to look at as we go. But this is the law, where it's 3% for residential, 5% for commercial, 8% for industrial, and 1% for agriculture. And particularly on agriculture, I was told by a colleague yesterday that um, the president of the PSA was on radio saying that farmers will have to pay $60,000 a year for one acre of agricultural land. Now that's absurd. I didn't hear it myself, eh? so I'm just repeating what I was told. But if such a thing was said, that's absurd. Because the rental value of agricultural land is going to be extremely low. It's going to be a few dollars. And then you take 1% of that. So if somebody is renting an acre of land for agricultural purposes, I have no idea what the annual rental might be. I may just throw out a figure let's say $10,000, and you take 1% of that, you're coming up with $100, you know? So, and that's the actual tax. So that there's a lot of misinformation outside there. There's a lot of fear-mongering, a lot of scare-mongering, and that is why I have tasked the public officials in the Ministry of Finance, get out there and hit the road for the next two to three weeks and try and deal with a lot of the misconceptions that are outside there. Misconceptions like the government will come and seize your house. We haven't even got to the point of an assessment. And when you look at the provisions in the act, there's a long drawn out process over a period of years with appeals, appeals tribunal, and, and, and all of that built in, those safeguards are built in to prevent that sort of, 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 of thing that only after you've gone through this thing maybe for 10 years, where you have a very recalcitrant um, property owner who has a huge property and just refusing point blank to pay tax for 10 years, then the legal process steps in and then it goes to court mm -hmm. and then you have to go to the, you, know, you could appeal, you know, and go to the court of appeal and, and so on. It could, take, it could take a very long time. So that for anybody to suggest that within a couple of months, the government will come and seize your property. That is just fear mongering and is one of the things that are outside there that um, just not correct. And um, let me just say one final thing. I went to parliament and I pointed out that the member of parliament for St. Augustine was paying $17,000 a month for his condominium in Florida. And yet he was opposed to paying $1,700 a month, one-tenth in Trinidad. And I did that to show the level of political hypocrisy. But there's another thing I want to say. I saw the member of parliament for St. Augustine saying that public servants sabotage the efforts of the People's Partnership government to repeal the Property Acts Tax Act. And I'm saying now without fear of contradiction, that is a lie. And I'll tell you why it's a lie. The People's Partnership government brought legislation to the parliament to repeal the Property Tax Act. And it lapsed because on close examination, it was determined that that piece of legislation that they brought to reintroduce land and billing taxes and repeal the Property Tax Act was 10 times more draconian than they claimed the property tax was. So the People's Partnership brought legislation. There was no sabotage. There was no anonymous group of public servants in the Ministry of Finance and the Chief Parliamentary Council's department who prevented the People's Partnership government from repealing the Property Tax Act. They brought a bill and let it lapse. So that is a lie. And I am saying that outside. I'm not saying that inside. All right. Thank you very much, members of the media. Uh, until the next time.